<laughs> I'm like, turn off today. Okay, so welcome to Defend, everybody. Um, our guest speaker today is Josh, Dr. Joshua Hudson, and he's from Seattle, Washington. He recently, but in the last few years, earned his PhD in nutrition science from Purdue University. And he studied the effect of meal protein quantity on changes in fat and muscle mass in adults trying to lose weight. So I think that's really um, an interesting topic for our DEFEND audience. And his research interests include protein requirements across the life course, optimizing dietary protein intake to prevent skeletal muscle loss, um, fat that's deposited in your muscle and skeletal muscle function. And right now he's primarily working with Dr. Elizabeth Borsheim, who if you remember spoke um, a couple weeks ago on her research related to timing of fat intake. And his work with Dr. Borsheim is working to determine the protein requirements of children with different physical activity levels using stable isotope techniques. So um, we haven't really talked much about stable isotopes, but they're what it's something you can drink and be traced in your body that um, can kind of tell how your metabolism is working. And in his free time, he loves to woodwork and spend time outside hiking, camping, and mountain biking. So it looks like our callers are increasing slowly. We'll get this sent out and um, we'll go ahead if you want to share your screen and get started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. There we go. Yeah, so like she said, my name's uh, Joshua Hudson, and I did my research at uh, Purdue with Wayne Campbell. Um, you know, most of, uh, most of my research has been around, really, this topic, the science of high-protein diets and how they influence changes in skeletal muscle mass or how we measure it, lean mass, fat-free mass. And uh, so it's really a pleasure to, to be here today to be able to talk about um, what I've spent so long uh, researching and thinking about. Um, so really, the, the, uh, what we're going to talk about today is really understand what the minimum requirements are for dietary protein, what we mean by high-protein diet, what does that mean, um, and in, in what context are we trying to talk about high-protein diets in terms of our outcomes, um, and then for uh, when, for whom, and kind of what's the purpose of consuming a high-protein diet, and when that may be beneficial. Um, so when we, we first have to know kind of what a normal protein diet is, like where do we start? What's our control? Where, where do we begin this discussion? Um, and we typically turn towards the, the, the DRI, so the reference intakes and the, the recommendations there. So we know that the requirement is really the lowest continuing intake of any nutrient that will help maintain a level of nutriture in an individual. And for dietary protein, um, we, we use nitrogen balance as kind of that, uh, the predefined nutriture level. And the EAR is the uh, estimated average intake that will meet that nutriture level for half of the individuals in a population, whereas the RDA is for two standard deviations above that, hopefully meeting 97 to 98%. And for, for dietary protein, that RDA value is about 0.8 uh, grams per kilogram per day. Um, but so what is a high protein diet then? Um, and, and really, in terms of relative body weight, broadly defined, it's anything greater than that. Um, and it's anything greater than that RDA value. And for athletes, um, it's recommended they consume anywhere from 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram per day. And that's really to help support metabolic adaptations or repair um, and support protein turnover. Um, and in older adults, that ranges between 1 to 1.2, but even all the way up to 2 grams in a state of malnutrition. And, um, um, but why, why do we care? Like, what is the, what, what, what are we trying to achieve? What problems are we trying to solve by examining the effects of a high protein diet? And it really starts out by, well, how do changes in skeletal muscle mass um, occur over the course of the lifespan? And when we look at early age, we see rapid deposition of skeletal muscle mass. We see increases in strength. And that tends to peak in early adult life and then kind of flatten out for a while and through adult life. And then it tends to drop off in 40s and 50s and a slow decline. Now, with adults, you know, especially now with the high prevalence of overweight and obesity, we see 
usually multiple attempts at weight loss. And during those weight loss interventions, we see rapid decrements in skeletal muscle mass and, and, and skeletal muscle strength, typically. And for older adults, that effect can be exacerbated. We, can, we know that their losses in muscle mass, um, whatever they are in, in uh, younger adults, it's even greater in older adults. So what we're tr interested in knowing is, is well, what, what level of protein intake above the RDA, um, if it exists, can help us prevent those losses in muscle mass that occur in um, younger adults who are losing weight or experience um, uh, acute or chronic illnesses, or in older adults that experience um, normal progressive um, losses in muscle mass throughout the life course, but also those rapid decrements that occur with immobility, such as uh, bed rest or responses to acute, uh, acute or chronic illness. Um, and so it starts off by kind of trying to get a, a framework for, broadly speaking, how dietary protein could help influence um, our muscle mass. And we know that at the, that the, at the tissue level, that broadly speaking, it's, the tissue mass is regulated by the protein turnover. It's this relative balance between protein synthesis and protein breakdown. And with an increase in dietary protein intake, where we can increase the supply of amino acids, hopefully increase our rates of protein synthesis, decrease our rates of breakdown, and promote an increase in, in skeletal muscle tissue. And what does that look like over the course of a day if we're trying to uh, 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 time course that out? Well, in, in response to our first protein-containing meal, we're going to see an increase in muscle protein synthesis as a result of consuming um, the protein, as a result of consuming those amino acids. And we're going to see a slight decrease in breakdown. And we're promoting a net gain in muscle protein. And then in the post-absorptive state, we're seeing a, a decrease in synthesis rates with a slight increase in breakdown. And therefore, we're seeing net loss. And this, this occurs throughout the day. And for most, of, for most individuals, this results in kind of a, 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 a no net gain, a net balance throughout the day. Um, and by increasing our protein intake, what we're hopefully doing is increasing our rates of synthesis um, at each of those meals such that at the end of the day, we're promoting a net gain or promoting a, a net positive balance in our, our, our muscle protein. So when we go and we review the literature and we're trying to figure out exactly um, what's the consensus, how does, um, what does the literature say about um, the effects of high protein diets on, on body composition changes like lean mass, which includes skeletal muscle? And we know that randomized controlled trials are really the gold standard. We refer to those because we're comparing an intervention group to some control group. Um, but when appropriate and when we have enough studies in hand, we can actually use a systematic review and meta-analysis approach. And that begins with identifying kind of what, what criteria do we deem necessary to, to um, search the literature? Because what we're trying to do is find all relevant studies that help us answer that question. Because um, there's usually more than one study. You know, one of the tenets of science is reproducibility. And so if we can kind of um, aggregate as many of these studies that help us answer this question, then we can be more sure about what the answer is. So we start off with this identification process where we go through and we have these search criteria and uh, we can go through and look at the databases like PubMed, Scopus, and CINAHL. And in this particular example that you see in front of you, there were over 1,500 articles that were identified um, as possibly being included. But after you go through um, uh, whittling that down, we actually ended up with only 18. Right? So it's quite a, an undertaking. It's quite a process. But there are then potentially 18 studies in the end that can help us figure out whether or not consuming more protein than the RDA is beneficial for changes in skeletal muscle mass. So we did this process actually back when I was at Purdue and is published in Advances in Nutrition. And what we found was is that when we looked specifically at weight loss in energy restricted studies, we found that there was no differential effect of consuming a higher protein diet versus the RDA. And what I'm gonna direct you to is on the, on the left side, what you're looking at is what we call force plot. And 
each of those lines across um, each of the rows represents a single study. And you've taken um, the intervention group um, value for changes in muscle mass in the control group, or in this case, the RDA changes in muscle mass. And you're looking at the differential change between the two. And then we can stack those up among all the studies that we found and find an aggregate value, what we call the, the weighted mean difference. And, um, and in this case for weight loss, amongst all the studies that were published that had to do, that compared strictly the RDA to greater than the RDA, that there was no effect uh, on lean body mass change, which includes skeletal muscle. But when you look at that, uh, when you look at weight loss in the context of exercise, although in this case, much fewer studies, um, that that effect is actually uh, positive, that consuming more protein than the RDA, in this case of about 1.3 grams per kilogram per day, um, can um, further uh, improve lean body mass changes. So, and in this particular case, what that shows is that there was a retention of lean body mass during that um, energy restricted period. Um, and in the context of resistance training alone, without, without uh, weight loss, right? We, we know that with, in response to resistance training, we see um, an increase in muscle protein breakdown such that there's a net loss actually in the acute phase strictly after resistance training. But if you can increase protein intake slightly after that period, you have what we call a net gain, right? There's an increase in muscle protein synthesis, a slight decrease in breakdown, so you're depositing muscle mass. And this was another meta-analysis that was done by Stu Phillips' group up at McMaster's University. And what each individual dot that you're looking at there actually represents a single group. And that group is plotted on the x-axis by the amount of protein that they were, that group was fed. And then on the, y, uh, the y-axis, that was the change from baseline to post-intervention in their fat-free mass. And this type of meta-regression is designed to look at at what point, at what intake of protein, is there no additional increase or change in fat-free mass or in skeletal muscle? And what they found, what Stu Phillips' group found, was that at about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day, while you're continually resistance training, without any type of energy restriction status, so they're, they're more likely in type of an energy balance or even in a slight surplus, that there's an increase in, in, in fat-free mass over a period of uh, ranging of about eight weeks to um, 16 weeks. So how about in the context of aging? Now we've, we, we know that with aging that um, older adults, you know, they do see a slight decrease in muscle mass each year of about one to 2% and which can be exacerbated during periods of immobilization. Um, you know, think about uh, uh, patients that have uh, contract pneumonia or those that have fractures and they're, they're stuck in bed for um, days, weeks on end. Um, they see rapid losses in lean mass. Um, so, and, and the same is holds true for when they're going through energy restriction or even um, um, in response to flu. So, uh, again, using that same type of meta-analysis technique, we identified five different studies. And looking at those studies of, of adults who were greater than 50 years old, we found that consuming a higher protein diet of about 1.3 grams per kilogram per day versus that RDA value alone um, had a positive effect of lean mass of about plus one kilogram over the course of that intervention period of about 12 weeks. So they had a 2.2 pound increase roundabout um, in, in lean body mass. So for at least older adults um, in, in kind of a range of, and this, and I should, I should clarify, this includes a range of catabolic and anabolic states. Some of these groups were resistance trained, some of them were energy restricted, some had a combination thereof. So this really is kind of a, an amalgamation of many different states. But what it shows is that, that a higher protein diet is kind of robust to all of those effects. And how about in response to aging and, and weight loss alone? So there's no resistance training included in this. And this was, a, this is again, another meta-analysis, you know, you're the same type of force plot that we've seen a couple times now where studies are stacked on one another and the intervention is compared to a control. And we can look at the weighted mean difference. And at the bottom, on the bottom right, there's a, a, a diamond there that indicates that amongst all the available literature, 
that if you're consuming um, a greater than one gram per kilogram per day or greater than about 25% of your energy as protein, um, as an older adult that's actively losing weight, that you can, um, that you'll see a positive effect on lean body mass changes by consuming a higher protein diet. Um, now this was, this is a, uh, another study that was done. This is a single study. So this is not a meta-analysis, but I'm pointing this out because this was specifically done in weight stability. So they took, um, adult men, uh, adult men, and they fed them either the RDA or 1.3 grams per kilogram per day. And it was a two by two study. So not only did they have changes in or differential uh, protein intake levels, but then they also had a testosterone supplementation group groups. And this was really designed to look at in weight stability over a six month, very controlled feeding period. How does lean body mass change in response to a higher protein diet? And so it's very, very controlled dietary intakes, very manipulated such that they were maintaining body weight throughout the entire period. And what they found um, is that when there's no other stimulus, when there's no uh, catabolic stimulus like energy restriction or bed rest, or there's no anabolic stimulus like resistance training, that the RDA actually seems to be adequate over the testing period, over that six month period, um, which is uh, really, I think, actually good news. And we see this actually uh, paralleled again in younger adults. So this is going back to that same type of meta-analysis that we've seen before. And instead of a single study here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different um, uh, uh, groups here where we're looking at, well, in the course of weight stability, where there's no ch active changes in body weight, is the RDA adequate to support um, lean body mass or does consuming that higher protein diet confer additional advantages? In the course of weight stability among um, younger adults, um, greater than 19, less than 50, it doesn't seem like there's any uh, additional benefit if you're not trying to actively change um, your body composition, actively change your body mass. So we've talked a little bit about uh, high protein diets, but what I wanna get back to a little bit is this idea of protein distribution. Um, it's a topic that has um, been um, much more pervasive lately, and it's been a, a topic of discussion of, of just how much you consume in each meal actually matter. Um, and there's, a, there's one thought is that about 30 grams of dietary protein is what it takes to kind of maximally stimulate that synthesis response, to maximally maximize the anabolic response to a meal. And, you know, in a, in a theoretical sense, um, it would look something like this, where you, there's kind of adequate high protein or mild, moderate protein at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, such that you're maximizing muscle protein synthesis at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But when we look at a typical dietary protein intake pattern um, using NHANES data, we, it doesn't look like that. We know that there's very little protein at breakfast, it gets slightly higher at lunch, and then think of that steak from Outback Steakhouse that you get uh, at dinner time, representing anywhere from 45 to 60 grams of protein. Um, and so when we're looking at, okay, well, how can, we, how can we improve this distribution of protein throughout the day? How can we improve our anabolic profile? Well, um, we can identify really breakfast as like a, 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 key, uh, a key meal, right? There's a submaximal synthesis response, MPS, muscle protein synthesis response there that we can take advantage of. And we can do that perhaps by taking a look at dinner. If we assume that 30 grams is what it takes to maximally stimulate MPS or muscle protein synthesis, then we can take some of that excess protein not being used for that and redistribute it onto some of those smaller containing meals like breakfast and lunch. And then that'll help us kind of get back to that nice even profile. And when uh, this was actually tested by Doug Padden Jones down at uh, University of Texas Medical Branch um, several years ago now, and what he showed was that when you do this redistribution of protein from the skewed intake, you know, high protein at dinner, and redistribute it to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, then you actually get a high, 25% uh, uh, higher 24 hour muscle protein synthesis response. So it was very promising there in the beginning. 
But since that time now, we've had several studies come out that have really tried to answer this question. Does redistributing dietary protein influence changes in, in skeletal muscle mass? And we're trying to take it from the acute phase of the 24 hour period and look at it over the course of time, anywhere from six weeks to 16 weeks. And of the available studies there, you can see that on the right, there's really only been two that have shown that there's any differential effect of this protein distribution on um, uh, lean body mass changes or skeletal muscle changes over the intervention period. And in fact, the, the first one there by um, Buyan actually show that perhaps consuming a skewed one might be better. Whereas the, the latest study by Yasuda, which is the, the last study there, um, they showed that that even distribution might be beneficial. But um, the difference between the, the groups there is actually is, is relatively small and kind of within the error that we would expect to see um, for the type of measurements that we use. Um, and so kind of taken together um, amongst the, the no effects and the small effect sizes, I think at this point, um, it's still kind of up in the air in terms of whether or not protein distribution because um, any demonstrable effect on changes in lean body mass, especially in the context of the robust data that we have on meal protein quantity, and or excuse me, um, on daily protein quantity. So as this is actually my last slide, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Um, so it looks like that in the context of weight stability, even for older adults and for um, and, and younger adults, that the RDA, the current protein RDA, seems to be adequate um, to support lean body mass. Um, and even in the context of mild energy restriction, where we're looking at 500 to 750 calories a day, at least for younger adults. In the context of, of um, exercise, it seems that consuming greater than 1.2 grams per kilogram per day is, is gonna be beneficial for lean body mass changes, um, with evidence suggesting up to 1.6 grams per kilogram per day can help facilitate muscle mass growth. For older adults, it seems that consuming greater than one gram per kilogram per day is going to be beneficial for um, during exercise and during weight loss and a combination thereof. Um, and while protein distribution itself may not um, uh, be a... Um, an effective way to influence changes in lean body mass, it seems that it may be an effective way to help older adults increase total dietary protein intake, such that they're, they're getting to that one gram per kilogram per day or that 1.2 gram per kilogram per day um, marker by taking advantage of, of those lower protein containing meals like breakfast or lunch. So I guess uh, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Josh. Joshua, um, if you want to unshare your screen, I kind of translated some of the things you'll see in the chat. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but any questions from Dr. Hudson? He comes from, and also now he's working with children, so he may be able to answer some of the questions if anyone has about kids. Um, and he came out of a really famous lab for high protein, protein intake. And it's sorry, okay, and I apologize for not getting that email out. Angela, who normally sends the reminders, is in charge of coordinating, is off this week. And we, uh, so thank you for everyone. I think like the 25 other people that called in in the first 10 minutes, we appreciate it. So I don't know if you want to take this, Dr. Hudson. Oh, yeah. The RDA. The RDA yeah. The, so the, the RDA is the recommended dietary allowance, um, and there's an RDA for many nutrients, um, but there's one for uh, dietary protein as well. And for dietary protein, it's uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. So it's the um, uh, level of continuing dietary protein intake to help prevent nutritional deficiency or protein deficiency in the 97 to 98% um, of adults. Dr. Hudson, I have a question. Yes. So I just want to clarify. You said the jury is still out on whether the 30 grams each meal is the best way to go. It doesn't mean that it's not the best way to go. 
ah. as of now, right? So I can say that it is just as effective so far as consuming a, a, a skewed distribution. There's no negative effect of it. Um, and so um, that I would say that the, the majority of the literature would suggest that right now it seems adequate. Um, if you're, so there's a lot of observational studies looking at these types of, um, this, trying to look at this answer. And um, so there's observational study, there's some acute um, stable isotope studies and some randomized controlled trials that are kind of trying to answer this in different ways. And it seems that if, as long as you're getting in at least one high protein meal a day, is at, um, like w one big one, kind of above 40 grams um, or above 0 0.4, 0 0.45 grams per kilogram in a meal, that it seems that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be okay. Um, that it's going to, you're going to uh, uh, get the benefits that, that you're seeking. Can I have one follow-up question? <laughs> Go for it, Sangeeta. Okay. So does, what, what is the medical or scientific community's stance on the quality of the protein? Animals, proteins, vegetable proteins, yeah. What kind of protein should you consume and when where yeah. where are you on that? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. There's a there's a ton of literature on trying to kind of get at that. Because there's many aspects that go into this, right? There's um of course quality, but you know, in the context of whole foods, we know that there's there's different types of um digestion and absorption that goes on and how that changes our, um, our body's response to those foods. Um, and then, you know, take into context macronutrients, um, you know, fats and carbohydrates, right? Those are all part of whole foods. You know, those are all part of mixed meals, like real, you know, foods that you're, or meals that you're consuming, you know, in life, you know? And, um, you know, so what we typically say is, is you know, if you're getting in, um, a mixture of plant and animal proteins that it, 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 you know, don't worry too much about protein quality. It seems to be a, a nuance that, because uh, and, unless you're talking about somebody at the far ends of the spectrum, like someone who's only consuming um, plant protein or only consuming single sources or only um, consuming um, one type of um, protein. Then we might be talking about, well, how can we improve that or what can we do to improve the situation or how might that influence the, their response to that, um, you know, or their, their meal distribution. But most of the time it's in the context of, of a, a mixture of plant and animal proteins. Um, and so in that context, it, it seems like it's, it, you're going to be fine. Thank you so much. And we are behind on our fast facts because as we're learning today, I think I said Angela is the organized glue that keeps Defend communicated <laughs> and on time. And she's out, um, out this week. So we'll have some fast facts and we'll translate some of the um, information that Dr. Hudson presented into um, bulleted tidbits that will help. And we haven't forgotten about last week either about um, you know, ideas for higher protein meals and snacks. Um, yeah, are there any, any more questions for Dr. Hudson? Yeah, so um, next week, another member of Dr. Borsheim's lab will be speaking, Britt Allman, and Britt's gonna talk about the science, um, where did it go? Oh, my, the latest science on physical activity um, she has a great um, background in physical activity and exercise out of Florida. Um, and also we wanted to share that we decided as part of Defend when we wrap up in December, we'd love to put out a Defend recipe book. Um, we're gonna ask all of our defenders to submit their favorite healthy recipes. We'll put in some tips, we'll put in our own recipes and we'll have everyone sign up who wants to receive one of our books. So look out for communication regarding um, 
the Defender recipe recipe collection. Um, any last questions? We're right around 12 o'clock. So we're happy to, we maybe can have Dr. Hudson for a few more um, minutes here. Yeah, be happy to answer yeah. anything or at least try. And Sangeeta, who just made a comment and asked the earlier question, is joining us from Florida. She's a former food science PhD student. So it was awesome that she spent her day off calling oh, cool. you to defend. Thank you, thank you. Part of my uh, undergrad degree, actually, it was, uh, it was nutrition science and food science. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I got a background in food science too, which I almost did a PhD in food science. Instead, I just, I don't know. Well, your, know your sounds way more interesting than rice drying research that I did. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I can recite your thesis, Sangeeta, because I saw you present so many times. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> But anyway, well, we want to thank everyone for joining us. Look out for our um, recipe book updates, I guess. And we look forward to having you. And thank you so much, Dr. Hudson, for giving us your time today and everyone else for joining us last minute. And we'll make sure we stay up on those reminders. So um, we'll post this by the end of the day today. And as Always, if you have questions or want some more information for some fast facts, just send us an email and we'll make sure we get everything together. Thank you. Thank have you. a good Friday. <laughs>